Welcome to the Alain Guillot Podcast, where we speak about personal development and entrepreneurship. This is episode 163. Today, we have with us Laura Garepi. Now, Laura is a freelance writer and a freelance coach. After 10 years of working in corporate America, she quit her job and started her business as a content writer and later on as a coach. She wanted to work around her life rather than to live around her work. Now, these are difficult times. The pandemic has forced a lot of people to work from home or a lot of people have lost their jobs. If you are one of those people who are looking for an alternative way to earn a living from your home, well, this is the episode for you. Laura breaks out how you can start a business online and, well, how she did it herself. So let's listen to the conversation. Laura Garepi, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So, Laura, we are in the midst of a pandemic. Millions of people are losing their jobs and many more are looking to work from home. And being that you are a freelance writer and you are also a coach, I thought that maybe this conversation could help some people find their way, find other alternatives. Yes, it's definitely a trying time. And if people can make money online from their homes, I think that's the best way to go. Okay, so Laura, to get started, I would like to know, a little bit about your background. What do you study? Where do you live? What were your dreams when you were going to school? What was your professional career before you became a freelancer? Sure. Um, well, I was born and raised in Massachusetts, but in 2014, I relocated to Central Florida. And that's where I live now with my fiance, his mom, and uh, an ornery but cute cat. Um I went to school uh, initially for early childhood education, but I changed my mind and ultimately got a bachelor's in psychology and then an MBA. Um, and I found myself in human resources. I was in that profession for about 10 years. And in 2018, I quit that job to go freelance because I realized the traditional nine to five wasn't working for me in terms of how I wanted to live my life. Like I wanted to uh, work around my life rather than live around my work. And do you realize this from one moment to the other or was this something that was developing over time? And what was the uh, uh, trigger point that allowed you to make that move? So I had been toying with the idea of early retirement. I came across the Financial Independence Retire Early Movement or FIRE movement um, a few years back. And I said, geez, I think I can do that. I think I can retire in my mid 40s and, and wouldn't that be grand? Um, but unfortunately in 2017, I lost a close loved one and I only had three days of bereavement time for my job and it just, it didn't seem adequate. So. I came to the realization that a lot more of those types of things was going to happen in the next 10 to 12 years as I work towards financial independence. And I just didn't want to wait that long to be able to really attend to what mattered most in my life. Okay. So what you just, once you realized that you just gave them your uh, two weeks notice or, or were you preparing slowly? Um, you know, I had been building a nest egg once I started getting into the fire movement a couple of years before my grandfather passed. Um, so, you know, within, I think, three months of his passing, I turned in my notice. It wasn't right away. Um, I guess maybe I was a little bit hesitant to do that, even though I did have a nest egg. But it was it was pretty soon thereafter. And why freelancer? I mean, what, what were the alternatives to you at that moment? I assume you have more than one alternative at that time. You know, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. Um, so when I left my full-time job, I had a couple of part-time remote jobs lined up just so I could preserve my savings. And I said, I got to learn about this online business world. And I realized that having a blog or a website was a major component of that. So I started a blog and then a few months later, I wrote a guest post and I got paid for it. And I realized I can make money doing this. And it basically snowballed from there. 
And your blog, what was it about? Initially, it was chronicling my decision to quit my job. It was essentially being branded as a sabbatical. Like at first, I wasn't sure what I was going to end up doing. Like I didn't know if I was going to work from home or work for myself full time, you know, for the foreseeable future or what was going to happen. I just knew I needed to make a change. So I reflected a lot about my thought process on that, about preparing my financings, my finances to allow me the time to have that period of time so that I could figure things out. Um, it didn't really evolve into anything concrete until I started freelancing. And, um, do you know, uh, many, let's say millions of people realize that they want something else for themselves. They want to change and they think about it. They read, they go to seminars and they do all this kind of thing except taking action. So you decided to take action. Can you take us through the mental conversation in your head of, okay, should I quit? Should I shouldn't quit? I'm sick of it. But at the same time, I don't have a job. Can you tell us about all these uh, conversations you were having in your head at that time? So there, there was some hesitancy because it, what I was thinking about doing is counter to traditional life trajectory. But I ultimately realized that I would deeply regret it if I didn't try and that I wasn't putting myself or my family in any immediate financial jeopardy because I did have the nest egg. So I realized that staying, doing what I was, was more painful than the threat of failure from trying something else. And how about the sunk cost? I mean, you have an MBA. So many people work so hard and pay so much money for an MBA. And, you know, you're going from an MBA in a corporation. I mean, you haven't told us exactly what is it that you did, but you're going from a secure job with a, with a, a degree that so many people envy to, to become, a, what is it, you are a freelance writer, right? Yes. Um, I mean, I still think that the degree carries some credibility, especially writing in personal finance, where the majority of my clients are. Um, however, I, I don't regret the sunk cost in terms of not using the degree in the corporate world. It's one of those deals where sometimes you have to make a pivot in life, and sometimes that means foregoing things that you've worked hard for. Right. Okay. So then you decide to become a freelance writer. Can you tell us a little bit of how did you develop that business? Because I'm also sure that uh, you didn't just make the decision and then there were tons of people waiting for your service. No, uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. But uh, it was it was a process. So I, I started my blog just to chronicle my my journey um, as someone newly unemployed and trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And then I wrote that paid guest post, um, kind of had the aha moment that I could make money doing this. And that's when I started to actually focus on it. So um, I responded to um, a call for writers that I saw on Twitter. And I still write for that client. They became my first recurring client. Um, I went to a conference just a couple of months later and picked up um, another client, maybe two, um, at that juncture. I started advertising on social media. I got myself a mentor. Um, I just started making connections in that, in that world so that I could get linked up with new opportunities. Um, and over time, over the span of a year, year and a half, I started making the same amount of money that I was previously at my corporate job. Wow, that's amazing. And um, is, it, um, is it possible to ask you uh, that first guest post that you did and you got paid for, uh, how much did you get paid for that? 50 bucks. All <laughs> so right. Not, not earth shattering, but still felt pretty good. Hey, you know, the first... <laughs> They say that the first dollar that you earn in the internet is the most uh, valuable dollar you earn because That's it proves a concept, you know, because if you can make one dollar, then considering how big the internet is, then you have the potential to uh, multiply it many times. Yes, it was validating. <laughs> um, you say that you used 
Twitter uh, to get the, your first recording client. Can you tell us a little bit about how how do people use Twitter to uh, to promote their business? I think you could do it in a number of different ways. Um, you can search for keywords, like you can even search, um, call for pitches, call for writers, and see if there's anything that makes sense for you to respond to. You can connect to other bloggers and small business owners, so that way if they have a need um, and you've been interacting with them, you're at top of mind. Um, so it's basically cultivating and maintaining an active network. Um, and then you can just advertise your services flat out. And I, I definitely advocate for that because people can't hire you if they don't know that you're open for business. So be loud, proud, and often about sharing that you're available for hire. Okay, and I also know that you are in LinkedIn, uh, but I stay in with Twitter for a moment. Uh, so those are things that you can do. Um, what do you advocate, but, uh, but what do you recommend in regards to posting? How often and, and uh, sh uh, other than promoting your business, should you talk about some other maybe tips of the industry? How, uh, can you share your um, strategy for Twitter? Yeah, I mean, I do think you should be posting really regularly because Twitter moves fast. So not everyone you're connected with is going to see everything you tweet unless they specifically go to your profile and kind of scroll through that. Um, but I do agree that there needs to be a mix of different types of posts. You're not constantly bombarding people with sales pitches. So if you can offer tips and tricks, maybe pose questions to people so that they can engage and you can start a dialogue uh, and also comment on other people's posts and, and share their things. So, uh, you know, if it would help your audience to share someone else's content, why not do that too? Okay, great. Uh, and you also mentioned that you got yourself a mentor. How do you find that mentor? Because I feel like, uh, especially in the internet, people take, I don't know, a 90 hour class and then they declare themselves a business coach and then they want to be coaching, I don't know, executive or whatever. So uh, how to all these people who are mentoring coaching, how do you find the one that is for you? Um, I mean, I think there's a, a distinction somewhat. Um, mentoring to me is, is usually something that happens on more of an informal and unpaid um, basis. And coaching is more formalized and typically paid. Um, so in terms of finding my first mentor, I actually was linked up with them at that conference I went to pretty early on in my business. It was part of the admission price of the conference is being hooked up with a mentor if you so choose. Um, and that was really beneficial. This um, this person had been freelance writing for um, multiple years and had already had a six figure writing business. And so she was really able to give me some pointers that helped. And ultimately she helped connect me to other people which turned into opportunities down the road. So the more people you know, the better in whatever capacity. Um, in terms of deciding if a mentor or a coach is right for you, it it really, you have to trust your gut. Go in and talk to them. And if they feel like they, if you feel like they know what they're talking about, if you have a good rapport, if you sense that they have your best interests in mind and you're not just a dollar sign to them, then it's probably okay to proceed. But in terms of finding an unpaid mentor, I think that's where networking online really comes in handy because you'll get to know the people that are serving in that capacity or even if you find someone that you click with you could just ask them once you have that rapport built up right okay okay so then let's go to uh, uh as i mentioned at the beginning a lot of people have lost their jobs and there are so many who they are just afraid of jumping into uh, an elevator or, or the metro or whatever. So they want to work from home. And especially with kids at home, they want to also take care of their kids. So uh, a lot of people are looking to have a work a job from home. Can you more or less guide us on how can someone get started? I mean, you got started by by offering doing this guest post but uh is that the same way that everybody else should get started um more or less but not necessarily in terms of the the guest post the process i think looks the same no matter what service 
you want to offer in the sense that you need some sort of web presence, like a website, or you know, even if it's just a basic one pager to explain who you are and what you do, somewhere you can point interested people to to get a sense of, of um, your services. And then having active social media presence is important as well. So having those um, channels that are specifically branded for your business so you can promote yourself and network and basically get entrenched in the online business community. So that would be a good place to start. Um, I think, you know, if you're writing, you, you want to have a blog so you can showcase your expertise and your writing capabilities. If you're a graphic designer, you want to showcase a portfolio of some of your previous work, even if it's just from school, like if you're just starting out. Um, and then in terms of actually getting client work, I um, sometimes advocate for doing a pro bono piece like a guest post or a really small graphic design job if you don't have your work published elsewhere. I think that can be a good stepping stone to trade a small job for a referral and um, you know something else that you can add to your portfolio that you can then parlay into your first paid gigs. Okay. Um, before COVID, I used to be the owner of a dance school and we used to teach a uh, couple dances like salsa, Argentine tango, waltz, rumba, cha-cha, foxtrot, all these dances. But 90% of the clients, they wanted to learn one dance in particular. That was salsa. Since you live in Florida, you may know what that is. But uh, so my question is, in the freelancing world, although there are so many activities that people can do, web design, I, I, I don't know, uh, a freelance writer, what give, uh, I wonder what is the most popular gig available, something that most people jump into as, uh, as workers or most people look for that kind of service. That's a good question. I mean, I think it really depends on your skill set and your interests. Um, I mean, if if you know how to build websites, you could offer that. If you, um, you know, are really gifted in different academic subjects, you could become a tutor. Um, some folks can make money off of a blog without offering any other services. You know, if they rank really well in SEO, they they can make money through advertisements and affiliate partnerships. So I think it really just depends on, on folks' interests and abilities. Okay, so there's no one freelance a job that uh, most people are looking, like for example, you are a freelance writer. How big is the market? Oh, I know there are a ton of freelance writers across, um, you know, all niches. And I, I believe there is still room for more, for sure, because, you know, every piece of content you see online has to be written by someone. Um, and there's more and more out there every day. Okay, so sticking with freelance writing, um, for someone who starts, uh, let's say, this year, they hear, they hear about you, they feel inspired, they want to get started. A year from now, uh, how much could a person like that can expect to be earning? It depends on if they're doing it part-time or full-time. Uh, it depends on what niche they get into. You know, some niches are more profitable. It depends on their confidence and their ability to negotiate rates. Um, unfortunately, some folks stay charging low rates for a really long time, even though that they, they've got the experience and or the credentials. So there really are a lot of variables. I do think if, if you're going full time, if you're charging a, a good rate, if you're working in um, you know, a niche that, that pays well, you can be making you know, a full time jobs income inside of a year. And um, what, um, what, is, what are some of those niches that pay well? Personal finance does pay very well. Um, I think, you know, maybe some of the travel pays well. Um, I think like your DIY type of stuff um, pays well in terms of like uh, interior design or gardening. Um, you know, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I know that personal finance and travel are both both well-paying niches. And these are by... Um by words, I assume, uh, let's say, I don't know, a 500 word article or a thousand word article, uh, uh, and a beginner, what can they expect to get? Uh, a beginner, I think, should be charging at least 10 to 15 cents per word. Um, 
I advocate for pricing on a per document basis okay. um, instead of a per word basis. I think it's easier. I think it's cleaner. Okay. Um, but, you know, even early on, I was making, um, you know, 50 to to $100 an article for, you know, a, a, a thousand words or whatever. So, I mean, I think it's important for you, for folks to start at at least like 10 cents a word. Okay. Wow. That's uh. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, and then I guess as your reputation grows and people find you, then they can increase their rate, right? What What would be like a um, something on the higher end? Uh, I mean, I've made five hundred dollars for an article, but that was for a major corporation. So there's definitely a, a spectrum. Um, you know, you you could write. Um, paid posts for another blog that's similar in size to yours and you might be on the lower end because that's their budget or you could be writing for a big corporation or anywhere in between and okay and as a freelancer there are uh for example you have your own website you are your own boss and you get your own clients but there are also platforms where people i don't know yes bid on 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 jobs uh uh, do you suggest having your own clients right from the start or can someone start uh, doing freelancing in somebody else's platform? You know, I'm not a huge fan of, of platforms like Upwork and, and Fiverr personally, just because you can make and keep more money by landing clients on your own. But I will say that if you're looking to get your first paid gig or two just to kind of jumpstart your portfolio, then it's not a bad idea to look there. Um, you know, because any any paid job to start off with can give you a confidence boost and can make your portfolio more attractive. Okay, and you have been doing this for a while now. Uh, can you describe, uh, uh, maybe not yours, but the, the ideal day for a freelancer? I don't know, do they work eight hours? Do they work four hours? Uh, and 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 how do they arrange their day? That's a good question. I think that's really going to vary from person to person and, and be based on their, their reasons for going freelance. Um, I know some freelancers that keep the same schedule as though they were working a nine to five um, because that works for them. But personally, I like being able to take off a day in the middle of the week if I feel like it or only work five or six hours, um, you know, depending on my workload. So I essentially just kind of look at what I have due for the week and make my plans based off of that yeah i i build websites i'm doing freelance as a website builder and i love to work like uh, from 10 o'clock at night until three o'clock in the morning that's like uh, you know the time that i feel the most creative and the most uh, that i can concentrate the best of course i don't do like um Many um, coaches suggest that do the hard work early in the morning, and then you know I just I just do my hard work late at night. So, but I guess to each his own. Absolutely, you have to do what works for you. Okay, so um, and I also saw in your um blog that you do some coaching. Can you give us some information about your coaching? Yeah, so I had been answering a lot of people's questions on an informal basis for a while about freelancing um, topics. And I realized that there was a need out there for coaches to help um, employees transition into self-employment. Um, and so I created a program that addresses a bunch of different areas, including finances, um, client acquisition, uh, the right mindset that you have to adopt, and then basically how to coordinate your life around your new freelance business. Um, and so I recently started offering that this spring, and I do have uh, a few clients that have signed on. And so far, it's been very successful. I've gotten great feedback, and I, I look forward to continuing to offer that. And what are the biggest barriers in regards to mindset? Uh, what are the biggest fear that most people have in regards to freelancing? Um, they're afraid that they're not going to be able to get enough work. Um, they're not sure how to price themselves. They're not sure um, how to sell themselves. So it's just having to go and get the work instead of, as an employee, 
just automatically being assigned tasks when you punch in for the day. So it's, it's, I think that's the biggest shift. Okay. And okay. You told us you quit your job and, uh, uh, what was the impact on your social life? Uh, I guess at uh, one moment you had, you know, an office with, full of uh, colleagues and, and co-workers, and then the next day you are home. Can you tell us also how does that work out? Uh, do, do you have some uh, problems adjusting to that life? You know, I am relatively introverted anyway, um, and I do like solitude um to a point you know the, the pandemic has has gotten me a bit stir crazy um so making that transition wasn't that hard and i think it's it's helpful that i don't live alone you know my fiance and his mom is is here so i still do have other people that are, are nearby um and then that's what they make like telephones and and webcams and airplanes for you know there's other ways to stay connected Okay, uh, so one last question in regards to uh, you writing. Okay, so let's assume I have um, I, I'm a financial advisor and I would like uh, I like you to write for me a um, a blog post per week on on giving some financial tip. Is that mostly how it will work? And then you will write per uh, 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 you say you didn't write per per project, right? So so is that something that is that how it works, your job, when you write for some other people? Yeah, yeah. We, we come to an agreement ahead of time about the quantity of um, projects, you know, per month that they're looking for. And um, then we agree to a price based on, you know, the complexity and the length and their budget. Um, and then essentially I just do the work and invoice them when it's complete. Nice. And also, I assume you write with uh, SEO in mind, the search engine optimization to, to uh, bring up some of the keywords of their job, I guess. Yes. Um, some of the clients or, are more um, interested in SEO than others. I have some clients that are like, yeah, I don't care. And then I have other clients that provide me extremely detailed briefs with the keywords that they want and the slug that they want and how many times to write each keyword. And so it runs the spectrum. Right. And does that cost difference, same price or a different price, depending on whether they want SEO writing or not? Um, I would say that uh, SEO writing is, is more expensive. Um, I, and that's primarily because the clients that are really focused on that also seem to have um, pretty strict parameters otherwise in terms of how they want you to structure the piece and what sources you can use. It's like there's there's a lot more that you have to follow as opposed to just saying, here's a topic, go write about it. So the more complicated the assignments are, the the more money that they command wow okay that's i think you have given us a lot of value i hope some of some of my listeners will go and check out your website i wonder if there is anything that i didn't ask you that you would like to share that's a great question i think you you covered so much um i'm happy to talk to anyone about freelancing at any point so any listeners have any follow-up questions for me they can certainly check out my site or they can email me at laura at everydaybythelake.com okay uh yes i was going to ask you about your uh, your uh, website uh, but uh can i ask you um what kind of reading do you do and if maybe you can uh, refer us of a book either for pleasure or for work i do a lot of reading when it comes to business stuff i admittedly probably should do more pleasure reading. I just don't seem to find the time. Um, right now I'm in the middle of a book called The Wealth Gardener and the tagline I think is Lessons in Prosperity from Father to Son. Um, another personal finance writer mailed me the book and it's basically instilling life lessons to his child um, that center around personal finance and entrepreneurship and productivity. And so, um, so far it's been a really engaging read. And uh, since you write mostly, you work is mostly about uh, finance or personal finance. This is, uh, I guess, reading new books all the time keeps your idea fresh and, and you know, they help inspire, inspire a new topic of writing, I guess, no? 
Yeah, for sure. And I, I do scan a lot of other blogs as well. Um, because you can only write a how to create a budget or how to get out of debt post so many times without feeling like a broken record. So right. um, absolutely important to stay inspired. Okay, so Laura, one last time, uh, give us the name of your website and all your social media where people can follow you. Yes, yeah, so my website is everydaybythelake.com. On Twitter, I'm at everydaylake. And you can find me on um, LinkedIn. Uh, it's Laura Garabee. Okay, well, thank you so much, Laura. I hope uh, I hope the listeners found some value in this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I hope so too. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye bye.